My name is Paula Johnson. I'm a curator in the Division of Work and Industry. Um, and I was also the project director for the food history exhibition, uh, Food Transforming the American Table, which is in the gallery right over there, and which will be open uh, for you all later this evening. Um, it's great to see so many friends of the American Food History Project here. Thank you so much for your continued support. And it's great to welcome new faces uh, to our food history programming. Uh, we hope you'll come back again. I have one general announcement. Uh, please keep your cell phones on and join in the conversation with the hashtag history after hours. Uh, so do tweet if you, if you do that. <laughs> um, and now we're, we're delighted to welcome our guests, Sarah Franklin and Alex Prudhomme. Uh, to the stage for tonight's program, The French Chef American Style. Um, we'll be going back to the 1970s to explore the renewed interest in American regional foods after what we think of as the French Chef era of the 1960s. Um, we'll be looking at this shift through the biographies and the work of Julia Child and Judith Jones, her longtime editor. Um, our speakers, I believe, are uniquely qualified to take us on this journey, and it's my pleasure to introduce them. First, I'll introduce Sarah. Sarah Franklin is a doctoral candidate in the Food Studies program at New York University. Her work uses oral history to investigate individual and cultural re relationships to food, cooking, and agriculture. Sarah was a lead researcher for the American Museum of Natural History's Our Global Kitchen exhibition, the other one that opened in 2012, mm -hmm. like ours. <laughs> and she also worked with community-based organizations in the US, Brazil, and South Africa, using agriculture as a tool for poverty reduction. A former vegetable farmer and a pie baker and uh, urban agriculture instructor, she consults with various food and agriculture organizations and small businesses to increase their capacity and educational outreach. One of her recent projects has been to conduct a life oral history of Judith Jones, and so we'll be hearing about that in a bit. Welcome, Sarah. <laughs> and Alex Prudhomme has been a journalist and author for 25 years. He's written on a wide range of subjects for the New York Times, The New Yorker, Vanity Fair, and many other publications. He's authored five books, most notably as co-writer of Julia Child's memoir, My Life in France, which will be on sale later today, um, which was a number one New York Times bestseller and inspired half the film, Julie and Julia. His book, The Ripple Effect, The Fate of Freshwater in the 21st Century, inspired the 2012 documentary film called Last Call at the Oasis. Um, his latest work on hydrofracking was published by Oxford University Press um, in November 2013. Um, he's currently writing a book about Julia Child in the 1970s with the working title The French Chef in America, to be published by Knopf in the spring of 2016. Alex, by the way, is Julia Child's great nephew, for those who didn't know, so there's, there's no doubt, uh, doubt about his authority on this topic. Welcome, Alex. Thank you. <laughs> So I'd like to just begin our conversation um, by asking each of you to tell us specifically about your work and how it sheds light on this uh, period on this evening's topic. Alex, uh, tell us about why you're focusing on Julia in the 1970s. How did that come about? Well, um, it didn't start out as a book. It started out as a film. Um, when Julia and I were working on her memoir, um, there were all sorts of stories that I had to cut from that book um, or had to use in a very truncated form. And a few of them stuck with me. Um, and one in particular was an event that happened in 1970 when Julia took a small film crew from WGBH to France. And it was an escapade that they called The French Chef in France. And she made a series of short documentary films about traditional French foodways. Uh, she told me um, a little secret when we were working together. She said, I've never mentioned this before. Um, I told everybody that um, the reason I was doing this was because I, I wanted to bring my viewers back to my original inspiration. Go to France, meet the people that had inspired me, show the viewers the food that I loved. 
uh, and how it is made by hand in France. And that was, a, that was the real reason she did this, but there was a secret reason also behind that, which was um, in the late 60s, uh, American fast food and supermarkets hit France really hard. And she was convinced that it was going to wipe out uh, uh, la cuisine bourgeoise, the traditional French home cooking that she loved so much because she knew how seductive supermarkets and fast food places could be. And so she sort of s said that she'd created this Trojan horse uh, in, in order to get this project underway. She didn't tell her sponsors, she didn't tell her bosses at GBH. It was only she and Paul who knew that there was a secret agenda. Um, so I love this story, and they, they, they were he in France for three weeks, and they had all these adventures, and a lot of it was filmed, even the stuff kind of behind the scenes. And there were stories that I had to cut out of the memoir, and I just thought to myself, you know, I wonder if those films still exist. So I called up GBH, and they said, you know, it's amazing, you just called. Uh, just uh, recently, there was a guy uh, walking on the back stairwell of a building, and he stumbled over some old film canisters, they were unmarked, and we were going to throw them out. But we decided we better take a look at them and just see what's on there. And it turned out these were all the original films from France 1970, um, including all sorts of outtakes. And it was a gold mine uh, just sitting on these back stairs. And I thought, wow, I'd love to see it. So I went up and I saw them, um, and they're fantastic. And I thought, well, this has got to be a great little documentary film. We put these together, and you know, I could do a voiceover or something. Um, so I started doing some research around this, and it was sort of like uh, walking down a corridor and opening one door, which led to another door, which led to another door. <laughs> Pretty soon I discovered there was a whole uh, series of events uh, that happened in the, in the course of the 70s, um, which took Julia in a, a completely new trajectory. And this is a, uh, a narrative that I was kind of aware of, but not really. Um, and so long story short, what happened was that Julia, uh, in 1970, produced Mastering the Art, Volume 2, with her friend Simca Beck, and the second series of The French Chef, which was the first time it had been shot in color and included some of these French documentaries. And they were released with great fanfare, and they did okay. They didn't do great. And, um, you know, after the sort of hoopla had died down, Julia was wrestling with this, wondering why didn't the book and the, and the series do better? What have I done wrong here? Um, and I think she realized that, that the culture was shifting under her feet and that people who um, were interested in food had already kind of been through the French episode and were recalibrating and were now kind of turning inward and were looking at what was happening here in this country. So she very consciously um, and I think kind of inevitably uh, broke away from classical French cuisine and performing as the French chef. She and Simka uh, loved each other, but they couldn't work together any longer. They were clashing, um, and they had a professional split, although they remained friends the rest of their lives. Uh, and Julia um, went in a new direction, and she began to write in the first person and tell personal stories. Uh, she started using recipes from all over the world, um, and she essentially re-Americanized herself, reinvented herself in her 60s, and this is during the 1970s when the whole world was reorganizing itself. And it was kind of this phenomenal um, second act in her life. And as I got deeper into my research, I realized that there were all sorts of stories that people either never knew about or have forgotten about in, in the intervening 50 years. And I thought, you know, this is just too much for a short film. This is really a book. And so that's the long answer to how I got <laughs> here. <laughs> there so, but there, will there be a film? I mean, is... We uh, we're working on it. We'll okay. see. We'll see. <laughs> great, great. Well, I know where we can premiere it. Okay. Well, um, Sarah, what, tell us a little bit about Judith Jones and what you've learned through your oral history research and yeah. her feelings at this time, because she would have been editing Absolutely. Uh, the second volume of Mastering. Mm -hmm. So I had, I just want to back up a little bit, I had a little bit of what Judith would have called a snatch the phone moment, which for those of you who've read um, her memoir, The Tenth Muse, My Life in Food, she talks about this moment where she met the man who became her husband, where she had run out of money in Paris and she had run to the end of the list of her contacts 
And um, the last man or the last person at all on this list was this guy, Evan Jones, who worked at this no-name magazine. And she tells this story about walking into her flea bag hotel and there was a woman in the lobby who was on the phone with Weekend Magazine. And she ran over and grabbed the phone from this woman and asked to speak to Evan Jones. And she, she often refers to this moment as, the, you, it's not enough to want it, you have to grab the phone. Um, and so I was lucky enough to be studying oral history when an email came through from the Julia Child Foundation asking how do we go about doing an oral history of Judith Jones um, and I, you know, didn't waste a breath and, and immediately reached out because, to me, Judith had um, always represented someone who had brought all the threads of the food world together, who was interested in literary voices around food and very technical voices around food and really didactic teaching work. Um, and it also gotten deeply into sort of what we might now call the DIY movement, uh, particularly up in Vermont, where she has a second home that she bought with her husband in 1980. And so when I started this oral history project, the first thing I did was went to the archives to look at her old correspondence when she was working at Knopf. And I, of course, reread her memoir and realized that lots of people have been talking about Julia. And, and there were you know, lots of stories and theories emerging around her, but very little had been done about all these other authors, cookbook authors, that Judith had worked with. Um, and I was really struck by this. So there were all these other authors that represented other foreign cuisines, but particularly starting in the mid-70s, she took a great interest in American regional cooking, beginning with a book that she published by Edna Lewis in 1976. And as I started reading and looking, it just everything started emerging, that, that, that the Back to the Land movement had taken off, which we can talk a little bit more about. And she was up in Vermont while all this was happening. Her husband, Evan Jones, was working on a monthly column for Gourmet magazine where he was traveling to different parts of the US and investigating regional cooking through interviews with home cooks. And so they were sort of working together as all this happened. Um, and it just became clear to me that that was a story, uh, Judith is now 91, that, that needed to be captured, particularly now as American regional cooking is really having this huge resurgence and there's tremendous interest. Um, and I, I really believe she was instrumental in sort of getting that on the literary publishing map in terms of cookery. And so I took it sort of upon myself to gather that story or those stories and also her reflections about them, sort of how she got there, what she thought of it all, and, and in her, the sort of twilight of her years, what she made of it all. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us how both Judith and Julia uh, defined American regional cooking in the 1970s? What, what were they imagining it was? And, was that, were their definitions the same? Were they widely shared by others? Judith talks about accents. That's a word that she often uses um, because I think regions were less important to her than threads that she could trace. So she was really interested in how people moved around, how stories got passed, how techniques and traditions and even foods themselves moved around. Um, and I think she was, she was really interested in what Calvin Trillin calls the sort of vernacular American cooking. She was not interested in what was happening in Alice Waters' kitchen, particularly in Berkeley. That, that was less relevant to her, and she was never all that interested in restaurant cooks. Um, and so I think the sort of particularities of how small communities had developed their own food cultures was something that she was more interested in than sort of how all of California might define itself, or all of you know, the South, mm -hmm. so to speak. Yeah, and I think Julia uh, shared that, actually. Uh, at one point, she and Paul wrote up a long list of uh, potential TV shows that they'd like to do, and one of them was a road trip across America where they would visit little regional outposts, and they wanted to go to uh, you know, a Wyoming um, ranch where they had a friend who cooked bison steak, and they wanted to go down to New Orleans, and they, you know, they wanted to kind of really parachute in, see what people were doing, and then go on to the next place and sort of weave the tapestry of what was happening across the country. In contrast to Judith, Julia loved restaurant cooking and would always make a point when she was in a restaurant to um, go back uh, behind the scenes and talk with everybody in the kitchen. And I've witnessed this many times. You could never have a short lunch with Julia because what would happen is, first of all, people would start coming up to your table and talking to her. And she'd stop, and we would all stop, and she would talk to them, and then they, she would sign an autograph, and we would just start the conversation. Anyway, you know, <laughs> finally, we'd get to the end of the meal, and then we would go back into the kitchen, and she would talk to everybody. And she usually knew the chef's story um, and would work with him pretty quickly, and she would work her way down the line. And the person she was most interested in was the dishwasher who came from 
Sri Lanka or Oaxaca or something, and she wanted to know his story or her story. How did you end up here? Mm -hmm. um, and what is your cooking like? Mm -hmm. And she was a real enthusiast. And so anytime people were interested in food and taste and, and cooking, Julia was there. Do you know if she made notes of that kind of thing? And, and no, she didn't really. Uh, but she had a great memory. Yeah. Um, okay. And uh, it was she was just a wonderful people person. Okay. She loved to talk to people. And she was, uh, you know, I've heard her talk to a bum on the street and the president of the United States in the space of 24 hours. And she treated them both the same. Mm -hmm. And mostly that meant she peppered each of them with questions. <laughs> 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 so. Let's uh, look at some specific examples. Um, Sarah, you already mentioned Edna Lewis. Mm -hmm. Tell us about how Judith met Edna Lewis, who she was, and how that relationship then grew into this collaboration. Yeah. So Edna Lewis was a chef who grew up in Freetown, Virginia, African-American woman. And she made her way to, to New York. Uh, she left at 16, and she first started as a laundress in New York, and then started writing for a communist newspaper, and then ended up as the chef at a place called Cafe Nicholson, which opened in 1950 and uh, had a tremendous following among the literary crowd, many of whom had come up from the South. And so they caught wind of the fact that Enda Lewis, her, her wheelhouse was making sort of country cooking specialties, that the restaurant was primarily French or French influenced. And so people like Truman Capote would come in and ask for biscuits or for fried chicken or for collards, and she would make them on request. And so meanwhile, she had published her first cookbook with a co-author called the Anna Lewis Cookbook, and it hadn't done very well. And so when they were looking to do a second book, she found Judith. Uh, they came looking for help, basically, and so they sat in Judith's office with her. And Judith just tried to get Anna Lewis talking. She, uh, Judith always talked about needing to pull the, vo the voice out of an author, be they a cookbook author or a literary writer. And so it took only a few minutes for Edna to start talking about stories of growing up. And she tells a particular story about how her mother would set halved eggshells, empty eggshells, on the window in the spring and put some soil in and plant a seed to start her seeds that would then get transplanted outside. And Judith dismissed the co-author, sort of saying, you don't need this person. You already have this in you. You've got the stories. You have the language. This is lyrical and resonant and evokes a time that is disappearing in a way of life that's disappearing. And they developed this wonderful friendship. And the book that came out of that first collaboration was A Taste of Country Cooking, which was published in 1976 and was one of the first books that really brought Southern cooking to a national audience. There had been community cookbooks for, I mean, forever that people had always been putting recipes together. That was nothing new. But to have a voice that was sort of speaking for a particular community um, and talking about a way of life in a deeply personal way put Southern cooking on a map in a very different way. It wasn't hugely politicized, uh, but it was very, very personal. Mm -hmm. And I think that struck a chord with people. And you have to remember the Back to Land movement is taking off now, and the envir environmental movement was really gaining ground at that time. And so what, what we might kind of now call back, to, uh, excuse me, farm to table ethos was really embodied by that book. Um, and it took off. It was a huge success. Thank you. Um, Alex, I just want to circle back to that road trip. Um, hmm. well, that would have been a fantastic experience <laughs> to, to have done. So they didn't take the road trip, but her interest in the uh, cooking in various places like the Wyoming and Oregon and places like that, how did she access those recipes, those cooks, those places? Um, well, Julia loved to read, mm -hmm. um, so she would just educate herself. Mm -hmm. um, and it was interesting because she was a history buff, and particularly culinary history. Um, one of the stories that I stumbled over in my research for this book I'm working on is um, in preparation for the bicentennial of 1976, she and Jim Beard decided they wanted to do a book and a TV series about colonial cooking. And it was called 13 Feasts for 13 Colonies, the original 13 colonies. And the notion was to go back and find out what kinds of foods people were eating in the original 13 colonies uh, in pre-revolutionary days. Um, and many of those recipes were brought over from the old world. They were you know, German cakes and English puddings and uh, French uh, chowder and um, 
Danish uh, donuts. I'm not sure what they were. But anyway. Edelstevers. Yeah, <laughs> right. Um, and this related to Julia's own family history. Her family had come, the McWilliams family, had come from England, settled in New England in Massachusetts, then went to the Midwest, then uh, to California. And so her story was kind of an archetypal American story. Um, and she had grown up eating Boston baked beans and uh, fish with egg sauce and these kind of classical New England uh, foods. And so she was drawn back to that. Um, and so they did a ton of research. And I discovered these binders and binders of just tons of research. They hired a researcher, in fact, Jose Wilson, uh, to help them. And they started to put together scripts, and I've discovered all these old scripts, and they actually did a pilot show, um, which never aired, but I've seen it, and it's pretty amazing. Um, they start off at Ye Old Waverly Inn in Massachusetts, where they have a fife and drum corps come out, <laughs> and then the camera goes into this uh, pre-revolutionary kitchen where there's a big pot of chowder on a fire um, and a table laden with you know, lobster and oysters and um, baked beans and um, various puddings, and it's, it's amazing. And Jim Beard was a sort of a walking encyclopedia of food, and so Julia would ask him uh, provocative questions and he would answer. Unfortunately, Jim, who had been trained as an opera singer and an actor, was terrible on television. So Julia would say, now tell me about the molasses in that Indian pudding. And he'd say, or, 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 like that. And um, he would look down, he would mumble, um, and Julia <laughs> kept trying to provoke him. And there's one point where they're grinding corn in a, corn, in a hand grinder. And she's pouring the kernels in, and she says, well, what happens if we take this piece off? And he's grinding, and suddenly the corn is flying everywhere, and it's all over the floor. It's very and Julia. And that's it's a very Julia, Julia moment. And she's laughing, and he's turning purple. And you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, It was a classic uh, contrast in styles. And unfortunately, um, for various reasons, uh, more than just that, uh, they decided not to do the show. Um, but this was an example of Julia kind of diving deep into something that she didn't know much about but was intrigued by, and she discovered this massive amount of stuff. And then, um, five or six years later, when she started at the end of the 70s, in 78 and 79, she did a series of um, menu cookbooks called Julia Child and Company, Julia Child and More Company. And she recycled some of those recipes in those books, so she never really forgot them. Um, and you see them cropping up in later work. And so it, it didn't all go to waste. Um, but that was one of those sort of hidden stories that I uncovered and that um, uh, will be fun um, to, to write and read about. And we want that footage. We want to show that here, too. <laughs> <laughs> Future program. Just taking notes. Yeah. Watch yeah, that's good. That's fine. I'm happy to do it. <laughs> um, you mentioned James Beard, and of course he is somebody who in, what, 72 published American Cookery and was well known for um, uh, his books on American cuisine. Um, talk a little bit about the 70s and the books he was doing with Judith Jones and what that was about, especially they, the bread book. They had developed a tremendous friendship, and, and Judith says they talked pretty much daily for 30, 40 years, until his death, basically. And so they were constantly exchanging ideas in books, cookbooks and non-cookbooks. I mean, they just were always chatting or cooking or having a meal together or cooking a meal together. Um, and so this, this sort of wave of change in the 70s was something neither of them could ignore. They were completely immersed in the sort of cultural scene of New York at the time. And things were changing, and people were really interested in what was going on at home. Um, and the bread book was really interesting because Judith thought she might do it at one point. And sh they started talking about it, and James Beard got really interested in it. And she said, well, why don't you give it a try? And he sort of took off with it. And th she tells a really funny story about him broiling a loaf of bread. I'm sure you've heard this too, Alex. But he really didn't have a clue where to start. And so part of the reason it was such a successful book is much like the first Mastering, he walked you really step by step through all these kinds of bread making as though you know, it was bread baking for dummies. Um, and that, there was a real hunger, I think, for that kind of book at the time, because there was so little teaching material. Mm -hmm. um, and he was such a friendly, jovial voice in the way that he wrote and in sort of his public persona. Um, 
And then Ju Judith went on to write her own bread book thereafter. I mean, I think this was an activity all sorts of people got into. And Julia wrote a really 12-page baguette recipe in yep. Mastering too. So, yep. I mean, this was, we talk about trends now, but there were trends then too, and break, baking your own bread was certainly one of them. Um, and, and this was just one example. Well, Judith was a real instigator here. Um, <laughs> when Simka and Julia were working on Mastering the Art Volume 2, uh, Judith suggested they include a bread recipe. And Julia's first reaction was, well, why would we do that? The French don't cook, make bread at, their, at home. They go to the, to the boulangerie and they buy it. You know, they get great <laughs> bread. Why would we do this? And Judith says, well, you know, I really love French bread and it's part of a French meal. We can't get good baguettes here. And Julia said, well, I don't know. Well, let me talk about it with Paul. Well, it turns out that Paul was a mad bread maker back in the day. And he, Julia was so busy finishing up Mastering Volume 2 that he then took on bread as a sort of a side project. And he started baking these loaves, which <laughs> Judith describes as looking like gnarled old uh, limbs from an olive tree. They would, he would mail them to her to try, and she would look at them and you know, <laughs> And she said they tasted okay, but they looked terrible. And so they, they, it, they became obsessed with this bread thing. And they ended up uh, going to France, bringing American ingredients with them, and meeting with Professor Raymond Calvel, who was uh, the, the master uh, boulanger. And he taught them how to uh, make proper French, uh, not only French baguettes, but other breads. And um, it was really Judith, though, who had instigated all yeah. this, and it became the thing that Julia said that she worked the hardest on that pe the least people paid attention to. <laughs> so. We tried it. Yeah. I think that the answer that you can get a good version of something by purchasing it never sat well with Judith. She really didn't right. like that mindset. If you could do it yourself, I mean, she, she spent a lot of her life up in the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont, and if you could do it yourself, you should do it yourself. And so a lot of her books, I think, reflected that ethos, and she would get people to start projects based on this sort of, she, you know, she wanted to fall down the rabbit hole of how to make tofu and how to bake the perfect baguette. And that was always, you know, going she to She was also the instigator the on volume two. She said, why don't you investigate charcuterie? Uh, <laughs> which actually really uh, rang Julia's bell. And so the next time Judith went up to Cambridge to visit, um, she came into the kitchen, which you see out here, and Julia had strung sausages of all different kinds all over the ceiling. And she had a, on the wall a giant piece of butcher paper in which she had written all of her various failed experiments and what she thought she had done wrong or right. And um, you know, and this is a great example of how the two of them worked together. Um, you know, I think of them kind of as co-conspirators <laughs> almost. And um, they are a kind of a classic writer, editor, but they were almost um, two sides of a brain yeah. And Julia and Simka always called each other sisters. So I think of Judith as the close, you know, first cousin, maybe. Uh, mm -hmm. She was right in there, and she was pushing them. Uh, she was constantly pushing Julia to do more, and then Julia would push her. Mm -hmm. She tells a funny story about how um, she was thinking, well, we maybe better explain this to the American home cook a little more. And Julia wrote this um, sort of, a rebuke back saying, don't go soft on me. You know, we don't need to hold their hands. Uh, they've all read Mastering the Art, Volume 1. We can assume they know a certain amount. And I'll tell you something, all these years later, Judith is still annoyed at that letter. Oh my gosh, that's <laughs> well, you have uh, brought us to uh, an important question about, about their collaboration, about their co-conspiratorial <laughs> nature. Um, would you talk a little bit about these two powerful women within the context of the times. The women's movement, um, changing roles of women in American society, um, how, how did each help support other women's careers and professional opportunities? Neither of them wanted anything to do with the women's movement as such. Um, and they both articulated that, which I always found really interesting. And you know, Judith talked about, she, I remember I asked her a question because I thought, well, my gosh, she's an amazing feminist. And she sort of slapped me right down and said, I cannot claim to have very strong feminist genes, and went on to list all the things that she thought of herself were feminine qualities that were particularly not feminist qualities and how important they had been to her career. 
Um, and she talked a lot about being diplomatic as sort of a chief feminine quality that was oh so useful in, in her editorial work, and that it was really important to sort of win by wiles. And I think she was always looking for people, for voices that were a little bit wily, that were a little bit crafty, that, that sort of took the long way around, that didn't totally follow convention. Um, and that, you know, from, for her meant not joining in with a movement that had, I'm a little hesitant to use the word strident, but, but sort of um, a bit of militance about it. And she, she wanted women to embrace things that she felt came naturally to them. And because of her time in France, in part, cooking was one of those things. And she felt if calling herself a feminist or aligning herself with the feminist movement meant that she had to give up any of the pleasure or joy she found in cooking, she wanted nothing to do with it. Well, both Julia and Judith made a point of saying how impressed they were with French women and how French women had kind of carved out their own role. It was very important in that culture. It was different from the way American women operated. And they admired the way French women dressed and held themselves and were um, uh, opinionated and yet were very much in love with their husbands and very uh, attuned to the family. And it was a, a sort of a style of womanhood that they both aspired to. Um, and yet, Judith and Julia were both very American. And uh, Julia always said that she did not consider herself a feminist. Um, although, clearly, she was hugely important uh, as a role model for a lot of women. Um, and so she may have been sort of a feminist despite herself, you know. Um, but, um, in terms of mentoring women, she was very uh, strong. I've recently interviewed a couple of young, no, no longer so young, uh, women chefs. Um, Sarah Moulton, who worked with her on, um, it's beginning with um, uh, Julia Child and Company, or Julia Child and Moore Company, rather. Um, and, uh, you know, Sarah had come from New York City. She had gone to cooking school. She had. Um, gone on a stage in France, and uh, she said, despite all that stuff, I still needed to work twice as hard as anybody else, and um, Julia really helped her. Um, and they ended up working on Good Morning America together, and they were lifelong friends. And um, one of the interesting things is that um, Julia didn't do this with everybody. She sort of picked people, um, and it's hard to know why exactly, um, what character trait, but I think generally what it was is that, you know, even though people like to think of Julia as kind of a clown and she likes to fool around and, and that was, you know, a genuine part of her, underneath it all she was very serious about cooking mm -hmm. and her greatest um, seal of approval was to say that uh, someone was a, a sérieux, a serious person and um, she thought of herself as a, a une sérieuse, um, and that I think if she saw that quality in someone like Sarah Moulton, she would then go the extra mile. Mm -hmm. What about what about Judith? What did she look for in young people to bring along? Because well, they weren't all so young. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think she was looking for voice. Voice was really the thing. So some of the some of the people that she worked with came to her through writing. Many of them actually her her friendship and work with MFK Fisher started through letter correspondence. Uh, Judith had written to her in admiration, and they started this many year long correspondence before they ever met or worked together. Um, and so the written voice was, was really very important. But I think there was also, she was looking for a little bit of a renegade spirit in people. Uh, she also wanted to work with real workhorses. She did not like recipe testers, and she did not like co-writers for the most part. So she really wanted to work with people who wanted to do their own projects and take it very, very seriously. And she also wanted to work with people who wanted to be in relationship with her. It was hugely important to her. I think the boundaries between her social life and her work life were, were almost invisible. Um, and people would come to visit at their apartment in New York, and people would come to visit at their home in Vermont, and often work from those places. And so she lost, uh, she talks about Marcella Hazan as an example of this, someone she really didn't get along with. And so their, rela their professional relationship didn't last beyond the first book together. Um, and so I think relationship and that sort of sense of nurturing one another was hugely important to the people that she really caught into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she said she fired Marcella. <laughs> oh. 
Well, I am at the point, point where I am um, supposed to open this up. I hate to, but I want to hear what you have to say. There's so much to talk about, but I know that you all have good questions. So please, um, any questions that, that you'd like to ask um, about Judith, Julia, any of the 1970s? Yes, right here. Um, more or less. I mean, it was a very romanticized vision of the truth, but it was, yeah. Um, you know, the thing that I liked about that movie was that using the Julie Powell character, played by Amy Adams, it opened Julia to a whole new generation of people who sort of were vaguely aware of her through their mothers or their grandmothers or whatever. Um, and, uh, you know, to have Meryl Streep playing Julia, you couldn't really cast anyone better than that. <laughs> and, um, um, but having said that, um, it presented a very romanticized vision of post-war France. I mean, the reality was that France was a bombed out wreck. And um, they were running out of food, they were running out of you know, gas to run the generators. Um, there were strikes. Um, it was the Cold War. There was a lot of tension with Russia. Um, it was a lot more intense. And we tried to get some of that in her memoir, but it wasn't a history book, it was a memoir, so I couldn't go too much on with that. But um, if you look at footage of France in those days, you'll see that it was, a, it was a, a pretty devastated place, which actually makes her adventure all the more remarkable. Um, it's hard to, to, to condense all that into a, a film, you know. Um, and so I think they did a great job. And, um, you know, the, my, my only complaint with that film is I wish they had more food. <laughs> uh, because ostensibly it was, a, it was a, a film about cooking and food. And they had a couple of great, gorgeous shots. I just wanted more. chocolate cake all in the magic box and pushed some buttons and <laughs> opened it and the cake kind of melted out and the chicken was still frozen and you know I think the vegetables were burned it was a horrible mess and and my friend who was at dinner with her that night ended up eating crackers and cheese and and drinking a lot of wine and had a great time but <laughs> Um, she was constantly um, trying out new things. Uh, 
I interviewed Dan Aykroyd about his impersonation of Julia. Um, because that happened, that SNL skit ran in 1978, right in the middle of what I'm writing about. And uh, there were two stories that came from Julia. Um, the first one was the Bassomatic, which I don't know if anybody saw the 40th anniversary recently, but he redid it <laughs> word for word. It was amazing that he could pull that off. But the story about the Bassomatic was that Julia had one of the early Cuisinarts. And Dan Aykroyd's aunt was the Julia Child of Canada. And she was, her name was Helen Goujon, and she was friends with Julia. And so Julia got her an early version of the Cuisinart. And they were at their lake house outside of Toronto. And Dan was age 12. And his aunt said, well, I'm going to make some bouillabaisse. And I've got this new machine from Julia. At which point, she took a trout and put it in the Cuisinart. <laughs> <laughs> didn't clean it, didn't scale it, nothing. Just, and the traumatized 12-year-old Dan Aykroyd remembered that story of this liquefied trout. And that, obviously, the, the reverberations are still being felt today. Oh <laughs> anyway, Julia was an early adopter. She loved gadgets. Yeah. Well, you heard it here first. That's a great story. Other, other questions people might have? Yes, Paul. So were there other, you both mentioned James Beard, were there other contemporaries that they admired and who influenced their work? And can you talk about some of the people they worked around that had big influences on them? Craig Claiborne was really important. Um, another sort of moment that proves, I think, Judith's boldness, which she will not claim or admit to, but when she got a copy of Julia's book, uh, she invited him over. She had never met him. She picked up the phone and called the New York Times. And he came, they made a deal. Uh, Judith and Evan had created a terrace on their apartment, on the edge of their apartment, and they were throwing parties and barbecues out there. And he said, well, I want to come do a story on your, on your rooftop parties, which were unheard of at the time, and the neighbors all thought they were crazy. And I'll read your book. And that began this incredible collaboration friendship. And they used to go out eating all over the city together. He really introduced her to a lot of the ethnic cuisines that were beginning to pop up in corners all over New York. So she speaks about him as being hugely, hugely influential on her. And, and I think also sort of keeping her apace. You know, a, a weekly food section is quite different than the pace of releasing a book. And you might do two or three a year. But he was working with writers every week who were, who were putting out content. Um, I'll let you talk about some. I mean, there are so many, so many. Yeah, it's hard to pinpoint. They, they were just, I mean, the food world uh, of the day was very small. And they mostly lived in New York. Um, there were a few outposts here and there. But um, when Julian Simka, uh, when, when Judith and Knopf published Julian Simka's book, Mastering the Art of French Cooking, Volume 1, in 1961, um, same thing, Ju uh, Judith called up Jim Beard, who she didn't know, and said, I've got this new book. We want to throw a party. Will you help us? And he said, sure. <laughs> and he invited all his friends. And uh, uh, an important person there was Helen McCulley, who was the editor of, um, which magazine? I'm blanking right now. Raina? You remember? Um, yeah. Anyway, she was a great impresario, and she mentored uh, young chefs like um, a guy just off the boat from France named Jacques Pepin, for example. <laughs> and so that party was held at the restaurant. It was called the Egg Basket. It was run by Dion Lucas, who was an English woman who had had a TV show, a cooking show, didn't do very well. She was a kind of a complicated person, uh, but generous. And she opened a restaurant. They had this party for the book. And it was the entire food world of that moment was in that restaurant. I mean, had you dropped a neutron bomb, <laughs> I don't think we'd be sitting here. But it was um, uh, remarkable that they all helped each other out. It wasn't a competitive thing. It was more of a, we are a, a small band of, of um, uh, you know, like-minded people. Let's all help each other and, and try to um, educate Americans about uh, delicious food. Mm -hmm. I think we have time for one more. Um, thank you. 
to spew uh, real venom about. Um, and you do not see it in her house, and she doesn't want anyone selling it, and she thinks the whole thing was a bill of goods that we got sold, um, and that Julia was, was responsible for helping turn that around, and then everyone she worked with in succession, I mean, they're really, processed ingredients just don't show up in the cookbooks that she worked on. You know, she went from working with Julia to then breaking down whole fish and beavers and bear and deer in Vermont um, in her L.L. Bean cookbook that she worked on in the 80s. So, no, total and utter hatred. Julia had a bit of a softer relationship with processors. Well, food. as with her food processor mania and so on, she was, um, she, she basically, she didn't love processed food, but she had an open mind, and she would, Paul, her husband, had a big, was a big influence, and he um, uh, studied something called general semantics, and it's a long sort of ph philosophy, which I won't bore you with, but basically, his big um, message to Julia was, put it to the test, put it to the empirical test, don't listen to what anybody else says, try it and see what you think for yourself. So she really took that to heart, and so she would try instant potato flakes, for example, and she said, well, if you put cream and butter, they're not bad, you know? <laughs> um, so she had a much more open mind. Simka was like Judith, eh, absolutely not, you know? Uh, she used to, Simka used to say, uh, I'm an old-fashioned, you know? I don't do the potato flakes. Uh, you know, Julia liked hamburgers and hot dogs, um, as long as they were good. Uh, she loved French fries, especially if they were cooked in beef tallow. And, um, you know, her, her concern was that with uh, what she called the anti-fat mania, that it was going to scare people away from food. And her whole message was to get people to love food and to try to cook and to, and to embrace food. And so she took some, what I think are somewhat tortured positions where she thought that, you know, irradiated food and GMO foods and so on were not so bad. Um, because she wanted people to um, engage with food and give it a shot. Um, and uh, I, I think in her heart of hearts, she was probably not a lover of processed foods. <laughs> but um, in her public messaging, it was always about try it for yourself. And if you like it, if it tastes good, go for it. And bon appetit. <laughs> That's a great. Oh, okay. One more. Well, you know, it's funny because, in a way, from the medical point of view, she's sort of been a little bit vindicated now because you come back. And About butter, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. right? It's, it's true. true. I, I think, think she's, she's laughing, laughing up there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I know this is a little off topic with her, but do you know anything? Yeah, well, if you go to the spy museum down the street, you can see her picture there, yeah. Um, well, Julia and Paul met in the OSS in Sri Lanka uh, during the Second World War. He was a senior guy. He was an artist, and his job was to design secret war rooms for Lord Mountbatten and um, create posters of enemy cam camouflage and battleships and poisonous plants and, and, and things like that. Julia was likes to sometimes hint that maybe she had been a spy, but... You know, a six foot two warbly voiced woman in uh, pearls is not exactly going to fit in. In know. fact, she was a, uh, a clerk typist and she handled a lot of secret material. But, um, you know, for them, I have to say, the war was a great adventure. They had a wonderful time. It completely changed their lives, it brought them together. And uh, as a result, uh, you know, they, they, as hard as it is to say, they had a good time during the war. And, uh, their second favorite cuisine after French was Chinese, and they spent time in Kunming after the war. And um, they looked back on that period very fondly, and they kept a lot of secrets. Uh, you know, they they really took their vows seriously, and they kept secrets until a certain point in the late '60s and early '70s, when, after Watergate and and various other uh, sort of depressing events happened, and they kind of um, started telling us in the family about those days a little bit more, but, um, you know, it was, a, it, was, it was a very exciting time. And I'll just add, we have the uh, signal mirror that Julia had during her work with the OSS um, on view in the exhibition right next door, so you can go up and see that. Don't have to go to the spy museum. <laughs> um, <laughs> the signal mirror was designed... <laughs> Sorry. There's a little backstory here. So the signal mirror was designed for downed airmen so they could signal a, a rescue plane.
And Julia loved this thing, and she kept it in her kitchen drawer. Yeah. And I used to play with it as a kid. Yeah. And so, yeah. Yep. Well, when we were doing the inventory of the kitchen, we opened the, the junk drawer, you know, lipstick, candle bits, little uh, champagne stopper from Jim Beard. And what's this? And he, this was the signal mirror. So, OK, um, we will have to wrap this up. But I want to say thank you so much for your wonderful comments and for enlightening all of us. I really appreciate it. So now I have instructions here, and I will try to do this right. Um, there are two exits, one in the back, and there's also one here uh, to get out into the um, uh, lobby area. Your food ticket is for the food table by the John Bull locomotive, the big locomotive out here. And I will say that the menu tonight, the chef has just you know, outdone himself. We provided some recipes from some of the books you've heard about, Edna Lewis's book, from um, James Beard's uh, On Bread, and uh, from Judith Jones's own book. Uh, so I hope you enjoy uh, the meal tonight. Um, please make sure you keep your food and drink out of the exhibit and way away from all the objects, um, including the signal mirror. Um, my Life in France is going to be on sale, and Alex will be signing them. Uh, there will be a free poster given to people who buy this book tonight. For, we have 30 of them. This is um, a poster, Palido uh, Olive, Extra Virgin Olive Oil. Um, this is a wonderful uh, bit of art from Sacramento, California. Um, so go out and get your books. And we look forward to continuing the conversation and welcome you back to our other food programming. You'll hear all about it. Um, just keep wa watching your email. Thank you so much for your attention. And um, um, there's also um, objects out of storage. We've brought some of the things out of storage for you. And also the um, exhibition will be open. So enjoy. Thank you. <laughs> There's a saying old says that love is blind Still we're often told seek and ye shall find So I'm going to seek a certain light I